Um, okay, so I'm the group leader of the Epistemology and Ethics of Machine Learning group. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm presenting work today that's in collaboration with Connor Mayo Wilson, who's in the philosophy department at the University of Washington, Seattle. So if you look at the first few pages of uh, these kinds of textbooks, like Introduction to Randomized uh, Controlled Clinical Trials, you'll see something very, some very impressive statements being made. Like um, the RCT is the introduction of scientific method into the process of comparing treatments. So it's kind of like equating randomized controlled trials with scientific me method in medicine, like a pretty strong claim, I would say. So what is an R RCT? It's the attempt to discover the relative effectiveness of some new intervention um, relative with respect to some standard treatment or placebo. And typically patients are assigned to different arms of the trial. Arms means either you get the live treatment or the placebo, or you get the experimental treatment or the standard treatment uh, by use of a randomization device. So this is widely considered the gold standard research design. Um, it's typically necessary for FDA approval and it raises a number of tricky ethical issues. So um, the RCT, I mean, has been uh, around dominant for a while, but in the last um, 20 years or so, there has been a proliferation of work on causal discovery with a focus on non-experimental data, observational data, so that the kind of data that doesn't come from a RCT. Um, and, you know, a lot of this, this work is interdisciplinary. It comes from philosoph philosophy, like uh, my old colleagues, uh, Peter Spurdy's Clark Lemore and Richard Shinas in the philosophy department at CMU, or it comes from computer science, um, Judea Pearl, or it comes from machine learning. Uh, like our colleagues here in, uh, in Tübingen, or it comes from epidemiology or, or e economics. But the point is, is that there's a proliferation of this kind of new work on causal discovery. And it suggests that maybe we should revisit um, the RCT. And okay, so um, the basic idea here is that if the ethical costs of RCTs are justified, uh, then it must be in virtue of some epistemic superiority that they have. And so in this talk, I'm going to try to address two things, like exactly what is the epistemic good which RCTs secure? And can that same good not be secured with some other methodology that preferably doesn't incur the same ethical costs? Okay, a little, a little bit of history. So uh, when you go looking for the first controlled trial, you often find um, uh, James Lint's um, uh, scurvy trial. So here's James Lind treating uh, uh, scurbaceous sailors with um, lemons. And so this was in 1747. He has a bunch of sailors, 12 sailors on board. Um, they have scurvy. They're receiving the same rations, but he's going to test all the going hypotheses at the time. So he treats two with cider, two with seawater, two with horseradish and mustard, uh, two with vinegar, two get sulfuric acid, and two get lemons and oranges. And so uh, at the end of the day, the only, the only group that showed any like uh, dramatic recovery was the lemons and oranges, and also actually the cider group somewhat did somewhat okay. Um, so this is often pointed to as, obviously it's not a randomized trial because he didn't randomize the assignment to treatment, but it was a controlled trial. Uh, and, and as far as possible, he tried to make the other factors the same between the different groups. And he was comparing this new, his new hypothesis with the standard kinds of treatments at the time. It took a few decades, but the, the British Navy adopted citrus as the standard treatment after a while. Um, but the randomized control trials haven't been with us for that long. I mean, uh, often you get this, uh, the streptomycin trial uh, as the first. Uh, so it was, an, it was an English trial in 1948. Uh, Bradford, Bradford Hill was uh, studying streptomycin for tuberculosis. And uh, this really, you know, marks the beginning of an explosion in randomized controlled trials. Bradford Hill becomes very uh, influential, um, proposes like a collection of criteria, which are the set of nine criteria for epidemiological evidence of a causal relationship. It's, it's, it's still influential. Um, and of course, Bradford Hill is working off of um, ideas from Fisher, which at the time were reasonably new. 
uh, coming up in the 20s and 30s. Of course, if you want to get into sort of prehistory now, you had C.S. Peirce uh, and Jastrow performing randomized experiments in psychophysics in the 19th century. And you can go as far back as the 18th century where people proposed randomized trials to test uh, Mesmer's claims. But, um, okay, basically the point of this is not just to give you a history lesson, but to show us that like randomized control trials are not, haven't been with us for too long, right? And um, randomization comes into prima facie conflict with therapeutic obligations. So what do I mean by that? It's, it's the idea that a physician should not recommend for a patient therapy such that given present medical knowledge, the hypothesis, the hypothesis that the particular therapy is inferior, inferior to some other therapy is more probable than the opposite hypothesis. And obviously uh, this can happen if, if the clinicians have an opinion for a particular patient, which therapy that they, they would do better on, uh, they will have to, and, and they choose to randomize anyway, they will have to come into conflict with therapeutic obligation. And it also uh, comes into conflict with the notion of individualized treatment and so here we have Schaefer in, in 83. Uh, although a patient who has been enrolled as a research subject in an RCT may benefit from the therapeutic effects of the treatment being tested, the fact that the treatment cannot be entirely tailored to that patient's special needs seems to violate the physician's obligation of unqualified fidelity to his patient's health. So, the, I mean, when you go to the doctor, you assume that uh, the, the physician will assign the therapy, which... Uh, they believe to be the best for you. And, and, you know, in an RCT, if you get, you have no guarantee of that, right? Um, yeah, okay. So, so this, uh, this kind of was an unworkable standard. If you require phys each clinician involved in the trial to be genuinely indifferent about what, what is the best treatment for the patient in front of them, that makes it, uh, it's too fragile, basically. It makes it impossible to run an RCT. So, so in the 80s, uh, Friedman proposes a different idea, like clinical equipoise, clinical equipoise rather than theoretical equipoise. And that holds not when the individual clinician is genuinely uncertain about the patient in front of them, what, what they would do better on, but uh, it holds so long as there exists an honest professional disagreement among expert clinicians about the preferred treatment. So if you think about Lint, I don't think uh, Lint thought that seawater really worked for scurvy but there existed an honest professional disagreement among ex expert clinicians at the time about whether seawater treats scurvy. So even if he believed uh, uh, seawater was like a, you know, seawater was ineffective, it was ethical for him to assign some of his patients to seawater because the field was in a position of clinical equipoise. So this discussion in the, in the ethics of clinical research presupposes you know, the, what I'm calling the tragic view of clinical research. So uh, the tragic view is, is this, it's there's some valuable epistemic good secured by randomization and any trial methodology which secures that good must inevitably come into conflict with the requirements of an individual treatment. And uh, according to the tragic view, the job of clinical ethics is basically to do therapy on clinicians so that they accept the situation. Uh, so here's Bendler in the SCP article from 2021. You know, these clinical instincts, which while understandable and laudable, have the potential to obscure the true nature of clinical research as investigators and participants alike try to convince themselves that clinical research involves nothing more than the provision of care. One way to address, to try to address this collective and often willful confusion would be to identify a justification for exposing research participants to net risks for the benefit of others. So the job of clinical research ethics is basically, well, just come up with some reasoning that allows the clinicians to get over this difficulty. Um, but is the tragic view right? I mean, this, this I don't see like examined as much. So what is the valuable epistemic good secured by randomization? And is there really no methodology that reconciles it with uh, the ethical requirement of individualized treatment? Of course, I mean, randomization doesn't only come into ethical criticisms. I mean, there have been critics of randomization who just attack it on purely epistemic grounds. Famously, Bayesians have a hard time uh, rationally reconstructing randomization and, and, and why? Well, it's the idea that like, well, if you're Bayesian, you have, a, you have a lot of, you have a very rich and informative prior 
And uh, there just is some way of assigning uh, patients to treatment that would be most informative for you. And so why would you randomize? I mean, sometimes this point is, is, is put in a different way. If you have um, a decision problem where you have some preference between the different acts, randomizing between them makes no sense from a, from a first person epistemic utility kind of perspective. And of course, there's other critics that are non-Bayesians. The theory of optimal design doesn't endorse, optimal, optimal design of experiments doesn't endorse it. Philosophers of science have been very, some philosophers of science have been critical of, of its coherence. But I, I don't want to go into that that much. I just want to ask, on its own terms, what is the best frequentist justification for randomization? And... Um, if you ask this question, well, you get kind of into deep waters and statistics, but here it's a very old literature going back to Fisher, right? So you kind of step into every cow pile in statistics that there is. Uh, but um, here's how I understand the argument. So we have, we have some causal situation like this. We have uh, a treatment variable, which for now, let's think of it as binary, treated or not. Uh, an effect variable, which is binary, also recovered or not recovered. Um, we have some measured covariates. These are things that uh, are available during analysis, during the statistical analysis of the trial data. And we have some unmeasured covariates, things that aren't available, things that weren't, uh, maybe they're in principle un unobservable, or maybe they just weren't observed. And then we, we might have some randomizer. Now, those arrows are dotted because they may, these causal effects may or may not exist. Um, so the goal of an RCT, I think the, the contemporary understanding of the goal of an RCT is to estimate the average treatment effect. The average treatment effect is, well, it's the probability in the population that someone would recover were I to assign them to treatment minus the probability in the population that someone would recover were I to assign them to placebo or to standard treatment. Um, that's one way of understanding it, but also uh, in some in some in the, the potential outcomes framework is understood slightly differently. It's essentially um, there is some uh, difference for every individual in the trial between the probability that that individual recovers were they assigned to treatment minus the probability that that individual would recover were they assigned to placebo. So for uh, there's just these counterfactual facts about them. Uh, and so you just take the average for everyone in the trial. So the N people in the trial, you take the average of that quantity. Um, I mean, depending on which, whether you're used to kind of potential outcomes from epidemiology or causal graphs, you will prefer one or the other way of formulating it. And it's kind of more or less intertranslatable. Um, so this is the trouble with observational studies is that if there's an unobserved common cause of treatment and outcome, it's easy to come up with examples in which the average treatment effect is not identified. So what do I mean by not identified? I mean, it's easy to construct uh, models in which the treatment effect is different and yet the, the distribution over the observed variables is the same. So there's nothing you could do statistically to recover the average treatment effect. If that's the case, it means, you know, different treatment effects, yet same exact same uh, statistical distribution over the observed variables. That means nothing you do statistically will recover the right treatment, could recover the treatment effect. That's very sad. Um, and if you need an example, it's, it's easy. Like if, if the relationships are linear, um, here we have two variables, x1 and x2, and, the, and we have one on a, they, they have, exogenous noise terms, epsilon one, epsilon two, and there's some unobserved uh, noise term, some, so some unobserved confounder, epsilon three. And they're just linear functions, and I'm just giving you the coefficients of the linear functions plus noise. Now, if you have the situation on the left, um, I can generate the exact same distributions of distribution over, uh, joint distribution over x1, x2 with the graph on the right. So we flip the, epsilon one and epsilon three, and then we fiddle with the, the coefficients and we get the same distribution over X1 and X2. And typically C won't be equal to AC plus B. I mean, if B is not zero. Um, and so that's sad, it's tragic. 
So the point of randomization is um, that it breaks edges into treatment so that any association between T and E is due to the causal effect of T on E and not on shared common causes. So we had, we had this picture uh, with U and M being causes of T. We went to this picture where we, inter in, we flipped a coin to determine T. So now neither the observed nor the unobserved covariates have any causal effect on the treatment assignment. Um, and the nice thing is that this situation ensures that the ATA, the average treatment effect is identified, meaning different values of the average treatment effect will lead to different probability distributions over the observ observed variables. And it's really easy to calculate. You just do the first thing that comes into your head, which is subtract the conditional probability. And when you do what comes naturally, you get an unbiased estimate of the, of the average treatment effect. And what do I mean by unbiased? I mean, that's just uh, on average, it's equal to the true value. Now notice that unbiasedness is a fairly weak property. Like if I, you know, the, the joke about the statistician, you know, uh, they're doing, the statistician is doing target practice and they shoot, uh, you know, hundred meters to the left of the target, hundred meters to the right of the target. And uh, on average, it's, it's, you know, the shot is unbiased because on average they hit the bullseye. Um, so, but this is, this unbiased in this property is frequently cited as um, the advantage of randomization. So for example, Hernan and Robin say, in ideal randomized experiments, association is causation. So you can just do what comes naturally, compare the conditional probabilities and that will give you, give you the causal effect. Okay, but is breaking edges into T the only way to ren render the AT identified and construct unbiased estimates? Well, no, right? Or else there would be no talk. Um, for example, if you have an instrumental variable. So what is an instrumental variable? Roughly, it's something that's statistically independent of both U and M, and the only path from I to E goes through T. I mean, it should, I'm not gonna go into the technicalities, but it should be kind of intuitive that the I is, so if this is a randomizer and it's uh, independent, if it's a, for example, a coin flip, it'll be independent of U and M. Um, so here's an example. Suppose that um, phys physicians assign patients to treatment according to their therapeutic judgment. So um, that is consistent with observed covariates and unobserved covariates being causes of treatment. And they only consult a randomizing device when they're in equipoise. So this randomizing device is also a cause of treatment, but so are the observed and unobserved confounders. Well, then the coin flip will satisfy the assumptions of instrumental variables. And there's a nice theorem from, uh, econom from some economists, Angris and Imbens in 1995, when the instrumental variable satisfies this weak monotonicity condition, which it's not even worth defining here because it's too weak. Um, then the AT is identified and there is an unbiased estimator of it, um, which is also great. And you could do what comes naturally, basically let phys physicians use their judgment. And then when they're uncertain, flip a coin. Okay. Um, well, here's another thing you can do. For example, um, the set M, sorry, the variable M satisfies the backdoor criterion with respect to T and E. If M is not a descendant of T, that's obvious in this case, uh, M causes T, T doesn't cause M. And M blocks every path between T and E that has an arrow into T. Okay, that one's a little difficult to check. We won't check it here, but sort of you have to believe me that it holds. Um, and then there's this theorem from Judea Pearl in 1993. So if there is some observed variable satisfying the backdoor criterion, then it's possible to construct an un unbiased estimate of the causal effect of T on E. So, okay, suppose that physicians make assignment to treatment only on the basis of observed covariates, not on the basis of, well, you know, suppose they just have some protocol. Okay, if, if their blood pressure is this and their age is between this and this and their gender is that, then we assign them here. Um, well, then M will satisfy the backdoor criterion and you can have an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect. Um, there's, there's other ideas, for example, cutoff designs. So cut, in cutoff designs, clinicians rate patients on a continuous scale according to disease severity, and then they assign 
low slash high severity patients to either less or more aggressive treatment respectively. And then patients with moderate severity, they randomize. And then you estimate the average treatment effect by ridge regression. But what's the idea behind ridge regression? It's like, if you have some continuous variable and then there's just a cutoff point, um, then you basically assume that people very close to either side of a cutoff are very similar. So the entire difference uh, between the outcomes of people very close to the cutoff is due to the effect of treatment. Like people use this to study, you know, uh, some, if, if, for example, standard, some, some number on a standardized test is uh, a lower, you, know, you need to pass the, uh, be above the bar to get into university or whatever, then suppose the people who are just on one or the other side of the, uh, of the bar are otherwise similar, then you can use ridge regression to uh, estimate the effect of going to university on future income or whatever. Um, and there's a nice study by Capillary in 1995. It's actually just a simulation study, but the, their idea is that like, they have some people who have uh, drug dependency and some of them are, they kind of judge how severe that dependency is. And based on the severity, they assign them either to outpatient treatment, treatment at home, or they assign, assign them to inpatient treatment, treatment in the hospital. And in the middle, they randomize. And the criticisms of the, these kinds of studies is always about efficiency, which means not the bias of the estimator or the fact that, you know, uh, you couldn't construct some estimator. It's just, it's all about the variance of the estimator. So here, Sen has this, I mean, I, I suppose this comes out of a simulation. Uh, the variance of the estimator of the treatment effect based on how many people, what proportion of the patients were randomized uh, to treatment or uh, control. And you see, oh, there's a, there's a trade-off between the proportion that were randomized and how much variance there is in the, in the estimator. Um, but okay, but what, what, what am I trying to say here? It's um, neither guaranteeing that the ATE is identified nor that there isn't an unbiased estimator of the, e, of the ATE is sufficient to justify randomization. Why? Well, because other designs get you the same goods and also they're less hostile to individualized treatment. So if there is an argument for, for randomization over other methods, it can't be framed in terms of identifiability or unbiasedness. It has to be about efficiency or the variance of the estimate. Um, so are there such arguments? Um, the only arguments that I've found are a, the series of somewhat neglected papers. By neglected papers, like none of these has more than 30 citations on it. Um, de the developing a minimax, a minimax risk argument for randomization. So, okay, that's the kind of thing frequentism is all about minimax arguments. And um, okay, so here's the setting. Suppose that uh, for each patient, the effect of treatment is given by the fixed effect of the treatment plus some idiosyncratic patient effect plus some independent noise. Now, okay, this vector G is an assignment of effects to individuals in the trial. Um, now let capital G be the set of all assignments that you consider possible. Now we, we make a symmetry assumption. If, some, if you consider one of these assignments possible, then you consider the permutation possible. So if you think that uh, patient number two could have this, uh, um, this idiosyncratic effect, you must also think that patient number three or one or seven can. That's, that's a, it's basically like all of your, this assumption is saying all of your patients are exchangeable. Um, and here's a theorem. The fully randomized design minimizes the maximum mean squared error of the estimate over all the possible values of G. So the fully randomized design has the best worst case efficiency. But what do I mean? It's like you, you look over, so you take an estimator, you look over all the possible values of, of G and, and um, figure out its mean squared error of alpha there. Now, the, the wor in the worst case, now compare them all according to their worst case performance. Well, under some assumptions, obviously, uh, complete randomization minimizes the worst case error. And then Wu also pro proved some other theorems uh, about block designs. Well, suppose not all of our patients are exchangeable, but only there's some blocks 
you can divide, there's some partition of the patients where in, at least in the partitions, everyone is exchangeable and then proof some theorems about that. Um, but these arguments are, are pretty like um, parametric and they're all assuming kind of linearity. Note that we had to move away from the uh, binary outcomes uh, because we have this mean zero noise term here. Um, so my first question is, and then Connor and I are, are thinking about is, can these minimax arguments be generalized away from the linearity assumptions? What if we just have binary outcomes, for example? Um, that's just a kind of technical, like how far can we go with this minimax thing? But then the real question is, the real- So Constantine, about yep. five minutes left, if we want to have questions as well. Um, this is like, yeah, this is the last side basically. The, the real question is, what is the precise trade-off between individualized treatment and worst case efficiency? So in other words, if we want some percentage of our patients to get individualized treatment, how many more trial participants would we need to achieve the same efficiency as a fully randomized, randomized controlled trial with, with N patients? And another way of phrasing it is, what is more important, giving most participants individualized treatment or getting informative results with fewer participants? And this is, I mean, this is not a, uh, there's not a single answer to this. It's really going to depend on, you know, how severe are the side effects that you're thinking about. Um, but the takeaway is that if individualized treatment and estimation efficiency, efficiency trade off, we should be able to say something quantitative about the nature of the trade offs. And just because some trade off exists, doesn't mean we were justified in abandoning all therapeutic obligations. And I mean, machine learning uh, theory, of, you know, theory of optimization is good at managing trade-offs. So we should get scientific about this trade-off and not merely be, you know, scared by the existence of some trade-off into saying, well, like anything goes. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Sorry for running over.